How's it going, everybody? Brian Elvers and Dave Meltzer are here. Wrestling Observer Radio, June 29, 2024. Figure 4, online.com, slash wrestlingobserver.com. And yes, we are here today on a Saturday afternoon with a very special guest, one Tony Khan <laughs> is joining us here on this program. And Tony, how are you doing on this Forbidden Door weekend? I'm fantastic. I'm really excited. We got a great episode of Collision coming up tonight, and uh, it's been a great week. And I'm very excited for Forbidden Door this weekend. It's one of my favorite weekends of the year. Yeah. So, but there's a lot going on. This is this is like this is the biggest year in AEW history. I mean, just because of uh, you know the negotiations for the rights package and everything like that, which I consider the biggest news story of probably of the year, or at least of the rest of the year, and. Um, you know, and you know, basically uh, a story that impacts your future to a tremendous degree. Yeah, absolutely. And it definitely impacts AEW's future in a major way. It's going to be a great, great year, and also we're having a great week. Uh, all of the shows, Dynamite, Rampage, Collision, all the shows are up over the past week, which is exciting. And really, most importantly, we've got really, really exciting things happening. I'm having great talks with Warner Brothers Discovery. And as a group, uh, our business side, really, we've made, done a lot of work. I think we've uh, had a lot of great meetings, and we feel like we're in a really, really good place. A lot of exciting data and research we've done going into what's a really important time, like you said, the negotiation for the future media rights. And it's going to be something that's going to affect everybody in AEW and uh, a lot of our fans, obviously. The distribution of our shows is going to be a great situation, I promise. We're going to make a great deal for AEW. And uh, it's really exciting time, obviously, also with it being Forbidden Door Weekend, which, like I said, it's, uh, for many, many reasons, a really exciting time for us. So Thursday, you said that uh, you were uh, heading towards the goal line. Um, how close are you? Are you are you uh, are, are you like uh, what, what what yard line are you on right now? <laughs> I'm in the red zone, I said. So we're <laughs> in the red zone. So, the, I mean, in, you know, that's in the 20 and going in. Um, I don't want to say what part of the red zone we're in, but it, but look, that is part of a long journey. This is a drive that started five years ago, so it's a, that's a long series in football. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, over the five years, we've established AEW. We've built up multiple properties. We've established a great library and a great series and calendar of big events. We have a great cadence of TV shows. We have so much great wrestling that we put on every week and i think that really we've built uh, this great audience over the past five years with pbs and tnt and i really love being here i value the relationship and we're having great talks with them and uh, it's going to be an exciting summer and forbidden door it's really an important weekend for us the pay-per-view business has been really really strong for AEW this year and historically it's one of the real bedrock things about our business and there are a lot of things to figure out in this deal. Obviously, Dynamite every Wednesday right now. Uh, it's our flagship show we've been doing for five years. We're actually coming up on the 250th episode of Dynamite just in a few weeks, which I'm really excited to talk about and build up more. And there's going to be a lot of exciting things when we get out of Forbidden Door. Uh, going to Chicago next week for a really big card and what should be a great show for Beach Break. And, uh, you know, obviously with Dynamite, Rampage, Collision, and all these major events we put on, uh, I think we've got a lot of things to offer media partners going forward. And everything we've done, I'm really grateful. So far, it's it's uh, all been here at TBS and TNT. And like I said, I want to stay here and work with the people that I work with right now forever. Now, so, so, outside so, so, of just... Real, real quick, real quick. on on, Do you anticipate... Um, do you anticipate like again the the at, as of this point the only company that you've been allowed to negotiate with contractually is WBD, and that won't be much longer. Looking at the watch, right? <laughs> so my my question is is could it be um, a deal where I mean potentially you talk to other people, even how the NBA and WWE and and other companies have done, where you have maybe most of your program on this one, but maybe you add a program on another station or or do you anticipate one making an exclusive deal with whoever you make the deal with which right now today would have to be wbd or any, or if not you know so so kind of what what are your do you uh, what's your mindset on that right now 
Well, as you said, right now we're exclusively negotiating with Warner Brothers Discovery, which has been great. Mr. Zasloff has been tremendous with us, and I really value that relationship and the history we have here. So right now all of our property is on Warner Brothers Discovery, except for our pay-per-view business, which is relatively agnostic right now. We work with pretty much all the pay-per-view providers we can, distribute as many different ways as we can. There are a lot of different pay-per-view models out there. Just under the hood, across the street at TKO, they have really two totally different distribution models across yeah. UFC and WWE for the way that they do their pay-per-views or PLEs on their major events. And for AEW, for us, it's a, again, it's a different model that's worked really, really well for us and was one of the strong points of our business. But I think there are a lot of potential models for that going forward, too. Uh, so that's something to talk about. So uh, it's yet to be determined w what parts of AEW programming will be here and and i love having everything here in terms of the tv and uh, having a lot of different options for streaming but potentially all these things are on the table uh going forward so it's a it's an exciting time for us a really interesting time for us but it's you know it's been building to this for a long time and i think a lot of wrestling fans uh who've been with us along the way uh have been you know looking forward to this too it's a big moment for the company and uh Certainly, Warner Brothers Discovery, TBS, TNT has made it possible for us to be here approaching Dynamite 250, a five-year anniversary, and what's going to be really, really major media rights deals that we need to figure out and uh, are making great progress on by the end of the year. Now, you mentioned wanting to stay with WBD, them being great partners, etc., but what do you feel in terms of the time slots, length of the show, etc.? You started with just the two-hour Dynamite, added Rampage on Fridays for an hour, later added Collision on Saturdays for two hours, and then, you know, you've had occasional times where there's been a Battle of the Belts or Rampage has followed Collision. There's been a three-hour block on Saturday. And, 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 and occasionally on Wednesday, too. Yeah. A lot on Saturday, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. sometimes that third hour, you know, sometimes the third hour, it's like, wow, it did better than it would have done on Friday. Sometimes, for whatever reason, the third well, hour doesn't it, do as well. Well, it usually, it, usually, it usually does better than it would on Friday. Sure. But but, 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 it, but, question, but but sometimes it falls in the third hour. Well, that, we're on a really, yes. to your point, we're on a really strong run of Fridays. The last two Fridays have been the best since March. Yes. And we've really gotten them reestablished because there's so much movement, especially for Rampage, around... March Madness, and then again around playoff season for NBA and NHL with all those commitments. So there's a lot of things to your point to be determined, and I agree with what you're saying, Brian and Dave. That well, like, actually, you know, I mean, the question is like, what are you open to? I mean, have you have you considered the idea of maybe we should do a third hour block? Are you open to three hours? Do you look at Raw's three hours and go, well, you know, that's a lot of time for one particular block. What what are you open to? I think it's a great question. So I I. <laughs> We've done both ways, We've and a few different ways, I guess you could say. And I'm open to these things. I think with Warner Brothers Discovery right now, it's slotted this way, and I think there's a lot of merit to it. Right now, the shows have been performing really strongly. In the past weeks, Dynamite, uh, you know, obviously we had a really good week, you know, coming back this week off the holiday. And uh, really, I believe Rampage, like I said, it's been the best rating since March, a few weeks in a row the strongest back-to-back -back. and then collision was up 13 percent last week and the previous week we had beaten the ufc head-to-head -head straight up and that's like a big thing for a startup show like collision that's you know literally was celebrating one year and i think that with these shows and these packages right now warner brothers discovery has been a big part of these uh programming scheduling distribution conversations like we work hand in hand with them and i think they like what we're doing right now a lot so you know the way we're talking right now there's a ton of opportunities and like i said it's a very complex conversation there's a lot of things to be talked about in addition to max obviously a lot of people are talking about venue sports and that's a really unique opportunity i was just on the fox business channel the other day and i mentioned you know they're fox partners with warner brothers discovery in the venue and I think that's something very interesting. That is that, is that is that is that like the new streaming service they're looking at for next year, with yeah. with all the sports channels essentially. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that could be I something we could be a part of, and it's a really interesting conversation. That's a whole new conversation, and that's a new world. So there's a lot of really interesting, exciting things. But what's really cool is I don't think that Warner Brothers has had such a hands-on boss who has. Uh, overseeing the studio 
like this since Ted Turner was here. Uh, and, you know, at, t at TNT and TBS, like we have with David. And, you know, there is a supreme commander at the top of Warner Brothers Discovery, and he loves AEW. And I have a great relationship with him, and I think it's going to go a long way towards really keeping something that's very important to me alive, which is wrestling on TBS, TNT. When we brought it back, I always said, this is an American institution. There should be wrestling on these channels. I also had the same great conversations in England with the amazing people at ITV. I really feel that way also about in England. There should be wrestling on ITV. And I think it's been a huge part of our success. I could get hit by a New York City bus tonight and I like, Dar like Darby? People, <laughs> yeah, like Darby. I could get hit by like my good friend, and I was just about to bring him up, because uh, I could get hit by a bus tonight, and I would hope that people would remember that we sold 81,000 tickets at Wembley Stadium. We're about to put on another huge show with a massive stadium crowd, again, coming back to London uh, in August, and that Sting's retirement with Darby is one of the best things anyone ever did in the sport. And I re and that's all in the past year. And I really think that it's, we're going to keep growing and growing, but none of it would have been possible without Warner Brothers Discovery, and they've been with us through that past year. And, uh, you know, that's a really good thing for the company to have is the support of the head of the studio, one of the top most powerful people in Hollywood who loves AEW, loves what we're doing, and, you know, has gotten a look under the hood of AEW also, uh, very publicly, it's not a secret that they also have seen what WWE is doing, have analyzed it, and have done the comps. And I think there's a very glass half full story to that, which is they stuck with us and they want to be with us. And they had a chance to make a deal with someone else and they didn't. And, uh, you know, so that's really uh, something I think that's very important because when you look at the money that's being spent on media rights and what's out there, uh, I think. AEW, we provided great value for the dollar, and I think we'll continue uh, to provide great value. Like I've shown recently, you know, just talking recent numbers that we've been continuing to see strong patterns, strong rises, and I think this is our best time of the year where we're really going to just pick up and grow. Forbidden Door is always a great show, and it always does great business for us, and tomorrow is going to be no exception. This is going to be a fantastic pay per view. And that's really the reason I wanted to come see you guys. And I know the media rights is, is very interesting to a lot of people, and especially the people that work here, which is, you know, all the jobs and the livelihoods of the people that we're responsible for and have to nail this and land this plane for all the families that work here and, and for the fans. But also, this is like a really, really fun weekend for wrestling, especially for the hardcore fans like the three of us and everyone that probably, for the most part, is going to listen to your show. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's a good time to catch up with you guys. Well, let me ask one question before we move on from media rights, because this actually does also play into Forbidden Door tomorrow. Sure. And I know you won't answer the question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So okay. you're negotiating, and you're, you're nearing the end. But, like, uh, you know, about a month ago, there was the big announcement of, okay, there are going to now be multiple ways to, uh, to get this pay-per-view. Not just be our lie, but you can, you can get it here, you can get it there. Uh, there was the announcement of you can order the back pay-per-view through this service. And, you know, when we heard that, the first thing we presumed was, well, given that you're still negotiating, but you've now made these deals, that sounds to me like there's not going to potentially be a pay-per-view component to this new media rights deal. So that, I will answer but, that. There okay. Very well could, because be because yeah, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Because I actually know the I, answer, too. Go ahead. I think that has a lot more to do with the distribution through Bleacher Report and what the future of the distribution will be. There will be a lot of options that would, could potentially uh, be involved in this media rights deal. So, no, that's all still very much on the table. Uh, that was, of course, for five years now, we've been running pay-per-view events on Bleacher Report, VR Live, and then the Bleacher Report app. We've opened up and made more ways possible. I really appreciate Warner Brothers Discovery, and I want to make it super, super clear. I, I like that they opened up as many ways as possible for people to see the pay-per-views because it's something that will benefit us all and benefit the show. AEW has consistently put on great pay-per-views, and I think that's something that we really have built a great reputation on. We want people to see them. I thought that we kicked off this year with one of our best shows ever, and all three shows this year have done great business, and I think they've been all great shows with great big matches. And 
revolution top to bottom. I would put up there with any show we've ever done, probably the best thing we've ever done. And uh, also one of the biggest shows. And just in the past uh, year, we've had two of our three biggest pay-per-views in the history of the company. So there's tons of opportunities in the pay-per-view business. It's all still very much on the table. But you're, So, Brian, I, I may have surprised you by answering your question. Uh, it's, it, that is very much on the table. But this you know, summer, the rest of the year, we're available on a lot of different providers. And that's really something Warner Brothers Discovery has done to help us. But certainly, I don't want that to imply that we're not going to keep working together on pay-per-view options. And sure. there's tons of great things on the table. I, I am very happy that you've expanded it because I had many, many problems with uh, Bleacher Report. And a lot of the other options, they, they work better. And it's funny because, like, you know, with each of these options, it's like every time I have a problem with Bleacher Report, you always have all these people going, I've never had a problem once, ever. And then, you know, I'll, I'll watch I, it on I, some I, other I, system and people I, go, oh, I've I have a problem had, with that system all the time. So I've never had a problem with that, but whatever. whatever but I had uh, many. Yeah, Many. I I'm, I'm I, I try to order it through uh, my local cable. So, and and I've never had a problem with that. So that's except for one time, but it's so minor and they fixed it within seconds or so. Well, Tony, but, you actually you should tell us very quickly. I mean, what are the pay per view providers to get Forbidden Door tomorrow? Thank you, sir. I appreciate that, Brian. Uh, well, there's a ton of ways. Like Dave mentioned, your cable and satellite are tried and true. There's ppv.com. Bleacher Report, of course, uh, is great for a lot of people. PPV.com, Triller, YouTube pay-per-view. Uh, we've been doing shows uh, on all these different streaming and, and cable and satellite platforms. Pretty much any uh, cable satellite provider is going to have us. There's a lot of great ways to watch the show, and uh, you know I'm very excited about it. And it's going to be a great show. We're, of course, we haven't talked much about it yet, but... Uh, really exciting to have top stars from all over the wrestling world descending on New York right now as we speak. Any any movie theaters? Uh, I think, you know, movie theaters, it's interesting. We've still done some of the distribution with movie theaters, but, uh, you know, there's I've had, uh, from a business standpoint, I think there's pros and cons to it. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, other ways we've captured revenue. We've really replaced a lot of that, as, as, to the, as I've seen with Dave & Buster's. And Dave and Buster's has been a great partner and a great way to watch the shows also. So every, every, every day, there's something that comes up, whether it's an injury or transportation issues or whatever. And as you look at the Forbidden Door card, how close is this card to the card that you originally envisioned for tomorrow? This is the closest of the three Forbidden Doors. The first Forbidden Door, I did... Uh, talked to Dave around the original Forbidden Door and I called to Dave what was the original plan for the, like all the TVs going from Double or Nothing to Forbidden right. Door and it was so vastly different than what we ended up doing that Dave was like wow okay you did have to change the thought <laughs> and uh, and I've had a few things like that. Uh, that that original Forbidden Door was probably one of the two hardest things I've ever had to do in terms of changes I, the only thing I would put up there with that period around the summer of 22 around the original Forbidden Door uh, where we were making lots of changes. The only thing that's probably ever been as hard is actually in the past year. One of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with was when you lose one person out of your top two programs. And the company was probably at one of our hottest periods ever. You know, Grand Slam coming off Wembley Stadium last year, less than a month after the biggest ticket sales in the history of the business and a $10 million gate and a huge pay-per-view for us and just huge success and then we go to arthur ash and we did our biggest tv rating of the year for what is historically our biggest or one of our biggest tv franchises and it was such a you know great show in many ways mjf samoa joe huge rating you know two of our great world champions wrestling and to have adam cole get hurt in the middle of that's what everything happening with him and mjf that was really running red hot that in addition to john moxley injury in the ray phoenix match and I really felt like MJF and Cole with Samoa Joe and what was happening with Mox in the international title and Orange Cassidy, I felt like those were uh, our top two programs at the time. And to lose Mox and Adam Cole both on the same night, that was a lot. And, I, you know, going into Wrestle Dream and still having a great Wrestle Dream after that, that was hard. So the original Forbidden Door and then Wrestle Dream and, and Full Gear and everything after that. Those are probably the two hardest periods in terms of changes. This has been really great. And, uh, you know, it was very hard to lose Adam, I think, is the, is the big thing. And that uh, would be the main 
terrible change. And uh, Adam was on such a great run here and really wanted to be a part of the Forbidden Door. Um, how was that, that? To how, be fair, how, I've had that feels like it was a while ago because it was a month ago. But that's how crazy the business is. That like you know that that's a massive terrible change. Uh, and we've lost some other people along the way too. Uh, but they were not all like in the couple weeks leading up to the show. But to be fair, the changes with Adam and Eddie were massive. So yeah. this, I wouldn't say this is close to my original envisioning of the card, but post double or nothing, we haven't had as many problems with injuries and, and these kinds of things post double or nothing, uh, compared to, uh, some of the stuff years past that I would say was like just brutal. Uh, but losing Adam, and Eddie, they would have been a huge part of the card um, and uh, have had some other big injuries to people, too, uh, that definitely would affect it. But that being said, top to bottom, it's just such a strong card. I'm really excited about it. And most of the original plans are still in place. Obviously, the TNT ladder match, we had something different slotted there, and we're going to do something very different there um, if Adam hadn't gotten hurt. And with Eddie, uh, he would have been, like I said, a big part of this, too. A few other things, but... But thankfully, you know, Knockwood recent weeks have been uh, healthy and things have been good. And I th I'm really excited for the card. Uh, Adam Cole, I mean, do you have any kind of uh, update on him? Because it's been, I, I feel like it's been so frustrating for him, it's, uh, but but also for fans of him in the sense that, um, you know, he, he I, I thought him and MJF, you know, obviously the start of that program was, was you know, one of the hottest things that you had all year. And, you know, the Wembley, obviously, they were in the main event of Wembley, your biggest show ever. And then he goes down with an injury. Um, before you climax the program, and that, you know, probably caused, you know, the last three months of the year to go differently than it would have. Yeah. Um, um, and I was I know that to do the Continental Classic. I believed in that, and it was something I wanted to do. So I planned for, like, a tournament like the Continental Classic at the end of the year. But, I mean, that really came through for us in the end of the year. But uh, a lot of our other stuff changed, definitely. But... You know, Jeff and Samoa Joe did step up, I think, and they were having a great match at Arthur Ashe, and they had a great match at Arthur Ashe and did a great rating and great business for us there. Uh, and like I said, it was the biggest TV rating we had all year. And, uh, you know, like it was unfortunate to lose Adam Cole there in such a pivotal time for MJF, Samoa Joe, and Adam Cole while everything was happening. And uh, things unfolded very differently than I would have liked originally. Uh, but that was tough. And like I said, then you compound that losing Mox on the same night, our biggest star ever, and our most certainly our most reliable wrestler, and he still is our most reliable wrestler ever. And, you know, that was how bad the luck was. Even, you know, our most reliable, greatest star uh, got hurt that night. And that really changed things because I thought the world title and the international title were running as just hot, so hot, both. And Mox is the international champion. And uh, MJF with Adam Cole and Samoa Joe running for the world title. It was a great scene. And uh, so Adam Cole recovering from that injury. We obviously saw him make an appearance uh, recently on pay-per-view. Uh, I can't wait until Adam Cole can come back. I, I can't give you the exact timetable, but he will be back. And, you know, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be great to have Adam Cole back in the ring. He is recovering. And I can't wait to have him back. He's done great for us, but obviously... There have been multiple injuries that have sidetracked him, which is unfortunate because I think he's one of the best young wrestlers in the world. And like you said, he was in the main event of our biggest show with everybody behind him, and nobody can ever take it away from him. And I was really proud because before that, he had been injured, and he was running red hot. When he arrived in AEW, he was such a huge part of transitioning from 21 to 22, moving Dynamite from TBS, excuse me, from TNT to TBS, uh, Adam Cole was really big in that. And I really, really was so happy that he got running hotter than ever. And, you know, just the worst timing for him to get hurt. But, you know, like I said, losing Cole and Mox, the international champion at the time, on the same night. Uh, and, and what happened that night, it was, it was a big change for us. And I think uh, it's great now. You know, Cole will be back. And then look at what happened to Mox. And this is a perfect time to transition to Forbidden Door because, uh, you know, it's a great story. It's one of the most important things about this event to me is going into this. Uh, I've been so looking forward to it because you have Mox that we can celebrate. The first wrestler ever to be the AEW World Champion, the WWE World Champion, and the IWGP World Champion. It's a major historical accomplishment. And he's wrestling one of the greatest wrestlers in the history of New Japan and the person he defeated for the title in Naito. And 
you know, I think that's something really, really special about this show and uh, that we're bringing this event to New York. I think a lot of people are really excited about it. Now, when you mentioned Adam Cole, I want to ask you a question about your philosophy as a booker. So Adam Cole obviously went down, you know, he jumped off the ramp, freak injury, and it's like, that's it. It's, it's, he's got it. He's out. So you obviously had a long-term storyline, I presume leading all the way to uh, World's End, and it's all out the window. So as a booker, once that happens, in your mind, is it like whatever you had to Forbidden Door, like it's done? Or is it in your mind, when he comes back, we're going to pick up right where we left off with MGF and whatever we were planning to do when he went down? Philosophically, that that's a good question, it, and it completely depends on the situation, Brian. I think that these past few years, especially through the pandemic era, which affected everybody somehow, that it really is probably more changes in pro wrestling TV formats over the past like several years, especially like from you know twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty one, than anybody's ever seen. And then when you get compound injuries, incident, all the kinds of things that can change stories, um, we've seen a lot of it. So uh, it, I think it depends on who's still available, what happened, when people are going to be back. Uh, in that situation, it absolutely changed a lot of what we would have done and, uh, and had to do a lot of different things than we were originally going to do. There are other times where, you know, you might have, uh, a like for like type situation where you can still do a similar story, similar things. And then there's times where, uh, you know, crazy things happen. Eddie Kingston was always going to wrestle John Moxley coming out of 2020 because we kind of had built up that Lance Archer and Eddie Kingston would both be challengers in 2020 to Mox. But I think things went very differently when Lance one week tested positive for COVID and Eddie was there and we changed the match and moved the program up and if you remember it all out, it was always the final two in the Casino Battle Royale in 2020 to challenge Mox were Archer and Eddie. But uh, Archer not being there really moved Eddie up the rotation into the story that we were going to do later and build towards more longer. But we ended up going to it sooner and spotlighting it, and things were different then. And, you know, things played out differently than they would have. That's a good example from years ago. But... There's other times where uh, you just have to kind of change your plans. You know, you might not always have a good backup plan to move up into the spot like that that you were going to do later. Just depend. You know, one of the things um, I guess, and I, I've noticed this since since March um, when it comes to dynamite, is that the. Um, I mean, there's actually a couple of things about dynamite that I want to talk about, but but um, the one thing is is that the um, the male eighteen to thirty four when when you started. Um, to me, that was like a really strong demo. In fact, I'm I'm pretty sure that the first demo you beat Raw in probably was that on a I wouldn't say an every week basis, but but fairly often. I mean, Raw was down, you were on the ascent, and you know it was always like which domino is going to fall first. And it was males eighteen thirty four. You were getting a young audience. You were the hot thing at the time, and now. It's definitely gone in the other direction in the sense that WWE has gotten really strong. I mean, with with men, and your male eighteen to thirty four has has been the weak point. I mean, when people look at the drop in in um, ratings on on uh, Wednesday night, um, you know, and they'll just go, "Oh, you're doing terrible, you're doing terrible." And I'll look at like each thing, and it's like it's really you know, like um, male thirty five to forty nine had a couple of bad ones, but usually it's it's pretty much where I would expect. But the male eighteen to thirty four, even this week. Um, when everything was up, it was still down. It's been a problem um, thing, and and you know, part. I mean, I'm part of it is probably people shifting. There's you know to the other side. But what do you think when you look at that? Because I think that's an important one because it's like the hot. You know, it's it's still going to be, generally speaking, you know, a wrestling show is still going to be sixty to seventy percent male viewers. It's always going to be more ma males than females, except for. You know, there's probably some promotions historically where that wasn't the case, but very few. So it's kind of like that's an important thing, um, for, and so especially for television, because they're so hard to reach. You know, I mean, I know that like most TV shows would die for your male 18 to 34 demo number, but it has, right. you know, it has. That's the, and that's the important thing to look at. That's the perspective 
the, the last thing I would I would really stress what you said yeah. is most shows would kill for our 18 to 34 yeah, they demo. Would, they, would. And, they would. They would. And I want to continue, you know, building. I think that uh, having MJF back in recent weeks is going to be very good. Uh, John Moxley, you know, I'm excited about the summer schedule. He's defending the IWGP world title, but I have a lot of dates on John Moxley in the summer. Uh, hopefully, as the IWGP world champion, he's not in the G1. And I think that works out really, really well for us because Mox is somebody who's moved the, the needle a big time. And then, of course, we have other great stars like Kenny Omega uh, is a great example. We talked about Adam Cole, uh, Hangman. A lot of people that I want to get back into the show that historically have been really big draws to that young number. And a lot of the people you're talking about, they're still here. They just haven't been on the show as much. You know, MJF just wrestled his first match back last week, you know, the week before, uh, you know, 10 days ago, I guess, from right now. And I think MJF being back is a major needle mover for us. And the fact he wasn't on the show at all until these past couple weeks, it's, you know, I think not been ideal and we really want to get him going and like i said uh mox has spent a lot of time traveling wrestling in japan i really want to have mox here as ideally as the iwgp world champion but also uh defending it fighting in AEW. and then uh you know like i had mentioned to you uh i think the most important key point is that for us we've had historically really strong numbers and maintain really really strong numbers in tv and that is the thing we need to do is keep doing what we're doing because the numbers we have are numbers people in TV would kill to have. And I really need to focus on doing good shows for AEW, not about what competition is doing. I think that in this case, our competition going out ahead of us and getting good meteorites deals was a positive for us and actually uh, is good for us because we have very good historical comps. And these comps, you know, are very favorable for us. So that's one thing I've done is a ton of market research and retain top analysts and data scientists. And in looking at this stuff, the last thing you said is really the key thing, Dave, that most TV shows would kill for our ratings and demos. And in sports, we skew really young. And, uh, you know, instead of focusing on, hey, you know, when Kenny Omega and MJF and Adam Cole were on the show every week, in addition to uh, all these other wrestlers, and Mox was here every week, and everything was running perfect, then, yes, like, we've had these demos that are, you know, even better than what, you know, what we've had, but yet right now we maintain some of the best demos in sports. So I really do think it's important to focus on that because I think it's going to be a really, really good summer for us. And we had really good growth through last summer, too. And, you know, getting back to the best of what AEW does is really important to me. And historically, I think we've done a lot of that in the summer. You know, look at 2021, which is considered our best year. There was a pattern there, too, where we had moved around a lot with the playoffs, you know, stuff that sounds familiar now. And uh, people were kind of ready for us to, to pick up and get some steam going into the summer in 21. And that's really what happened because there it's remembered as maybe the, in many ways some of our strongest business, yet most of our strongest business has happened in the past year. Our biggest live event, our biggest international growth, uh, two of our three biggest pay-per-views, and we continue to grow that business. And the demos are really, really good for us. And I think there's a really very positive story to be told that's really going to benefit us in the media rights negotiations, but also something that you know we can hang our hat on what we've done and if you look 2021 is a great example where the year got much hotter when we resumed live touring and the show picked up and i think we have a lot of really exciting things it's not going to be uh, as dramatic a change in the show as you know when we res went from daily's place to resuming live touring but i do think historically the summer just like last year also is a good example uh we've seen things kind of heat up and i'm excited about what we have cooking and some of the things we have up our sleeve going into this pay-per-view. So obviously so, the uh, the main event of the show is, one of the main events obviously, is Swerve and Osprey for the AW title. And then you've also simultaneously got the Owen Hart Cup going on. And the winner of the men's and women's are getting title shots at Wembley. And you've got the Tony Storm match as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess the question is, 
when you've got like an Owen Hart tournament and you've also got a pay-per-view coming up and then you've got a big show coming, it's it's one of the fun things for fans is, okay, who do we think is going to win the tournament? Who do we think is going to win these title matches? How do we think they're going to get to Wembley? What are the big matches at Wembley? And it's fun for fans to fantasy book. And as a promoter, I would think that that's what you want to do is make it fun for fans to fantasy book where they think things are going. Are there ever times where you feel that, you know, as fun as this is, the fans have now convinced themselves of a certain outcome, and it is frustrating to you as a promoter to see, I guess, how certain people are of particular outcomes? It's interesting. I am within the wrestling business, as far as promoters, matchmakers, and executives go, I am probably far more sympathetic or far more in tune, like agree with the fan. If that's what they really want to see, then I should listen. So there's absolutely been times where I might have had an idea and then listening to the fan feedback, hearing what people really want to see, that's important. Now, I think there's a lot of different ways to get feedback from fans. Obviously, social media, you know, there's, uh, I can hear in the arenas live every week at the shows. And I think that's a really important response point too, because there's absolutely been people that got reactions in the arena that made you take notice and, and think that, wow, this is really working. Cause I want everyone to get a good reaction. I'd like everybody to do well, but some people get more over than others in the same spots out of similar opportunities. And I'm really, really excited about what we have right now because we do have a really really good group of wrestlers and we have a lot of really good stories going into this pay-per-view you mentioned some of the matches that i'm excited about uh you know with timeless tony storm mina shirakawa is coming and done fantastic for us and uh, that's a great relationship that's one of the things we haven't today talked much about but i've spent a lot of time this week talking about it is adding stardom as a great partner for us this year it's been really good it's been great for our wrestlers to have now an outlet where they'll be able to go. We've seen Willow Nightingale go over and defend the TBS title in stardom. And I think there's going to be a lot more opportunities in the future for the AEW wrestlers to go get that experience and compete for stardom, but also top stardom wrestlers to come here. And that's something I'm really excited about. Uh, Our women's division was really growing. And I think timeless Tony storm, is one of our great stars and i love working with her and i'm really proud of everything she's doing and i think she's phenomenal and we've got this great world champion but and everything that's been happening with her and her protege mariah may it's made for great tv for months now and now mina shirakawa coming into the story it's a it's really cool because i think um for people who do watch the shows and like AEW or, or give the show a chance and follow the shows I think it's been really fun and entertaining, and I'm a big fan of all three women, Tony Storm, Raya May, and Mina Shirakawa. And I think it's been a great way to introduce an international wrestler, somebody from stardom, a wrestler from Japan, into America, into our TV audience that might not have been familiar with her. And Mina gets big pops and has done really well for the show, in my opinion. And I think she would be a great AEW Women's World Champion, and it would be something that could really strengthen the relationship with stardom. So I'm really excited about that match, and it's a great example of the kind of cool stuff we have tomorrow on the pay-per-view. Yeah, I I think Mina Shirakawa is really overachieved as far as being a character. You know, I mean, um, so now that but not by but by design, Dave. Like it wasn't like I know know, she's star in the back, and I was like, she has no, you know, I was like, she has a lot of personality. Oh yeah, she does. She does. She does. And so it is by design. We didn't, you know, luck into it. Mina and uh, Mariah had this great history, and I followed and started them. They were at Club Venus, and they had a really overact in that they had a close friendship. And in planning this show and putting a story together, I was so excited to have Mina involved in AEW, especially with all the cool things happening with Mariah May and Timeless Tony Storm, which is one of my favorite things about AEW. And I really think that's really great, and I totally agree with you that Mina has come in and overachieved and been a really great part of the show and also has, like, a glove fit with what's been happening with Tony and Mariah and Luther. So now, when it comes to television, because, um, because you know, obviously, uh, pay-per-view, go, I mean, a pay-per-view go-home show is different than a show maybe three weeks before the pay-per-view and everything like that. Um, you have to get certain angles over at a certain time, and you have to hit the angles harder, you know, the last week, of course. Um, from a philosophy standpoint, 
when it comes to match time versus um, video time versus interview time and all that, have you changed or like is, have you changed your philosophy or are the changes basically well this is the right thing for this this certain week like, like I saw maybe, what you were saying I think this week was more because it was a go home show okay you know yeah you that's what that's what I was asking about. Done. if it wasn't a go home show maybe you you put four or five more minutes in some of the matches that were great right, this right. week and I completely agree with what you're saying but you also need to have the strong wrestling and things that move the stories great example yeah. I mean. I would have gladly watched Zack Sabre and Kyle O'Reilly wrestle for another 37, 45, 82 minutes, whatever. <laughs> you know, like could, right, right. You know, and uh, they could have had the whole two hours as far as I'm concerned. I think that was an important thing because Kyle O'Reilly has really been a great part of the show. I love the conglomeration. And mm -hmm. I think the conglomeration has been one of the really fun things about the show. And ever since Double or Nothing, Orange Cassidy... Uh, you know, we've seen him featured now more with Kyle O'Reilly. They had the tremendous match on Collision and really then came in and, and had been partners. And Mark Briscoe had been their partner. They did a trios match, an eight-man match. We've seen the conglomeration for several weeks together now. And I thought Kyle O'Reilly versus Zack Sabre with Orange Cassidy on commentary and Mark Briscoe getting everybody in the conglomeration and Renee all fired up. I thought that was awesome. And... I also had a lot of pay-per-view angles to cover, but you need to have good wrestling on the show, too. So, you know, there's another week, maybe where you're further out from the pay-per-view, where that could have easily gone twice as long. Or Phoenix versus Jay White's another great example. That was a great match, um, and I would love to see more of that. And they've had great matches, singles, tags, trios, with the Bullet Club Gold, uh, the Bang Bang Gang, and... Uh, the Lucha Brothers and the Death Triangle, and I, I look forward to more of that. That's probably a good segue. Uh, at some point here, I would love to talk to you guys about what's happening on the Zero Hour, because I do have a customer okay. acquisition oh, so, strategy so, here. Okay, so. So, so, so really quick, really quick, before I, because the thing that I actually asked you, so so are you starting the first match at 6, 6.30 or 7? Or I Well, I, that, that's, that's, I'm not saying the first match is going to start at 6.30. The Zero Hour is going into overtime, so we're going to do 90 minutes. And yeah, that's why right. I kind of had gone on social media and said, you know, this is a customer acquisition strategy. We're going to put a lot of stuff out there for free. Uh, it's, we've got uh, three announced matches. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm very open to doing a fourth. I might have one on Collision, and, and I'm excited uh, about the card, excited for Collision tonight and, and the pay-per-view and the Zero Hour, which I think will really be a great time of wrestling and also seeing the, the promos, the packages, building up the pay-per-view card, but also... The matches on the Zero Hour are very important for many reasons. They're great matches. They're great for the fans in New York. They're great for the fans watching. And also, it's a customer acquisition strategy. I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of people outside of the U.S. who want to see the Mystico teaming with the Lucha Brothers, especially against the LIJ, which, you know, you guys both know. There's a story there with Mystico because he's been wrestling these guys in Arena Mexico. Yeah. So... Uh, to have him come in and, you know, team with the Lucha Brothers, that's history. And to have the first time the Lucha Brothers ever team with Mystico be in New York. Well, they, uh, they, actually, they, they, they actually teamed once in Arena Mexico about six, eight years ago. But it's going to be the second time. I did not know that, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost nobody does. Almost nobody does. There was a period, and I don't remember what it was, where... Um, you know, um, Phoenix and Pentagon, and they didn't use their names. I guess they they were independents, and they were allowed to go oh, in and all that. okay. And um, so it actually happened once, but this is the second time. But but like having said that, um, when I saw that, as you know, everyone knows, I was like, wow, this is. I did not expect Mystico. I did not expect Mystico and Penta and Phoenix to be on the same team in the same match. Um, you know, that was uh, interesting and. and Probably something a year ago there was have been zero percent chance of that ever happening. Well, we right? should ask the question, Tony. How how did this happen? I mean, was this you? Was this Rocky? Was this everybody? How how did this thing happen? This was something I've really wanted for a long time, and it's something I've been pushing for is getting the Lucha Brothers involved in this show for the first time because they haven't been competing in it for the last couple of years. There's no reason they should they, they should be a big part of it. And to me, I thought it would be a great customer acquisition strategy. And I sit with Rocky, and I, now Rocky's in AEW, too. So I spend a ton of time with him. And we were batting around ideas, and this came up. And I felt really strongly about it. And it was something he and I uh, brainstormed. And 
uh, I really push for. And I can't wait to have Mystico teaming with the Lucha Brothers and, uh, you know, getting all this red tape cleared up to finally get the Lucha Brothers involved in Forbidden Door Weekend. And I think it's going to make a lot of fans interested in watching the show, especially because it's free. So people all over the world are going to be able to see Mystico teaming with the Lucha Brothers. I thought for the first time, now Dave, it's the first time Penta, El Zero Mieto, and Ray Phoenix. Under has, these gimmicks, yes. Yes. Okay. They had, they, they, had, they, had slightly, they had slightly different names, I believe, when, when they did it. I actually somebody, somebody actually sent me a thing, but I remember there was a short period of time where Penta and Phoenix worked some arena Mexico years and years ago when... You know, relations, you know, whatever the politics were. I don't even remember how it was then. but um, And they did very well there. They got very over. But then, you know, the, the politics of Mexico or the politics of Mexico are that you've had to deal with for all these years. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's um, you know, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a great match with Hiromu Takahashi. I mean, and, and you know, I mean, not just and Teton's fantastic. And Hiromu I'm so is, excited to have Suji. I've been so, oh, dying Suji to too. Suji Absolutely. over here with us. I love yeah. him. I think oh yeah, he's fantastic. He's, oh yeah, so, yeah. And, and, and he's worked Mexico, so it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it is yeah, a I, case by case basis in terms of who can work with who on what show. I mean, I think it's look, it's like if you're not working directly for the opposing promotions, and we're all friends here, like let's figure stuff out, right? And these are two of the great stars in Mexico, and CMLL has been great with us. Like we had not worked together until last autumn. And since then, again, it's been really good. Salvador is a great person. He had a Ring and, of Honor TV title change last night yes. Chris, on a CMLL and, show, and and Chris he Jericho did. last night on a CMLL show. So, okay, that that brings me to something. The other day, you were you were on when you were in the press call. You somebody had asked you about, um, you know, doing like a show in Japan with New Japan. Okay, now the thing that I think, especially since I've been watching Arena Mexico every Friday mostly. Um, the thing about Arena Mexico, I think that it's it's like it's that old school atmosphere. It's fantastic. I mean, it's it's you know what they do on Fridays. It's not exactly what you do, but is there any way of I don't know if it's a special streaming show or a special something where where you would bring down there? Maybe even a, a, a taping. I mean, is there? I because because sometimes I watch and I go like. Especially when I think I really got the idea when Moxley and those guys went down. And the crowd yeah. was just, and Brian Danielson, the crowd was just unbelievable. And it sold out. And it was one of the best atmospheres for any show yeah. of the year anywhere. And yeah. it's like, man, like, is do you think that there's a shot of doing a TV or a something as a special where, whether you know, something at, a, at li like literally at Arena Mexico? I've been watching these Friday shows. And believe me, I'm thinking the same thing as there's great opportunities for AEW potentially working with CMLL in Mexico. And I, I have a great relationship with Salvador. Uh, Rocky works with both of us very closely, and the three of us talk all, all the time. That is something very interesting, potentially, and that's up to Salvador. It's his building, and it's their territory. And, you know, I don't want to step on their toes, but I also think we could really do more together as a partnership. So I'm very, very open to that. Uh, potentially, and I agree with you. I've been watching these shows, and I see the same thing as you. Uh, I'm captivated by it. Of course, we just had Chris Jericho there, and that was a big reaction from the fans to that, and Mercedes Monet, and same as what you said, Dave, when the BCC went down there, and it's like, good Lord, like the reactions the guys got. I mean, you know, Seidel, uh, unfortunately, was uh, now he's injured, too, and uh, Wheeler Yuta had been injured. Now, thankfully, he is back. But Seidel was the substitute partner. You know, Seidel, Claudio, and just John and Brian. These guys got huge reactions. It felt like John and Brian were some of the biggest stars I've seen in terms of reactions in Arena Mexico. And, and, and Claudio got it. And then Claudio got a massive, huge reaction. And, uh, and, and, and Seidel did great in that match. Brian with Blue Panther, excellent. Uh, so lots of really great stuff that we've had from our wrestlers down there. But then also, like you guys just said, we have a new Ring of Honor World Television Champion, Atlantis Junior. Really excited about it. I love working with Atlantis Junior and Atlantis Senior. Uh, and uh, I loved having Atlantis Junior here. I asked for him specifically and really excited to work with him and really, really very pumped to have uh, Atlantis Junior as the Ring of Honor World Television Champion. Kyle Fletcher been on an amazing run of matches, I think. Uh, he's been involved in those matches on Dynamite. We had an excellent six-man tag with Kyle Fletcher, uh, Takeshita, and Roderick Strong versus what is now known as the conglomeration of uh, Mark Briscoe, Orange Cassidy, and Kyle O'Reilly. 
Uh, and then we had the eight-man tag with the conglomeration and, and Dante Martin kind of building up some of that TNT ladder match participants. In addition uh, to Orange Cassidy versus Zack Sabre, taking on Zack Sabre, Takeshita, uh, Roderick Strong, and Kyle Fletcher. And then uh, Kyle Fletcher in Ring of Honor. What amazing matches in recent weeks. The Lee Johnson two out of three falls match was fantastic. And several good matches involving uh, Kyle Fletcher and Lee Johnson now. Lee Johnson's been doing great stuff on Ring of Honor. And then uh, to have Kyle Fletcher versus Mark Briscoe after Kyle Fletcher pinned Mark Briscoe on Dynamite. And uh, what a great match last night. Excuse me, excuse me, two nights ago uh, it was on Ring of Honor on Thursday night. And then what a great match last night uh, for Kyle Fletcher versus Atlantis Jr. Kyle's just had so many amazing matches lately and has been great as a tag wrestler, was a great Ring of Honor World Television Champion. Uh, very excited about Kyle Fletcher and now very excited to have Atlantis Jr. as the ROH World TV Champ. We got a Mark, question. Mark, anything on Mark Davis real quick? Yeah, Mark Davis uh, out still uh, injured and hopefully will be back soon. Uh, that's another great talent that has been out unfortunately with a injury that sidelined him for a while we got a question here from uh, somebody in the uk he says has any plans to move the tv schedule in the uk so the go-home collision shows for the pay-per-views are actually before the pay-per-view right now he has to watch them after the pay-per-view that's true that's it's a great true. question it's a great it question yeah i think there's some it's it's challenging right uh i would love to work with itv possibly on a solution for that obviously there is the aew uh tv uh, AEW Plus, so there are ways to stream the shows beforehand, because I believe you can get it on AEW Plus before the pay-per-view. But, yes, you do, uh, you do. But to, on ITV, you would have to wait, to your point. And I, that's a great partnership, and I'm just really thrilled to be on ITV, but I think it's a great point that if we could get the go-home collision on before the pay-per-view, it would be really good, because there's some really good stuff, just like this weekend, to your point, uh, to the very intelligent person who wrote that in, Brian, I don't know the name, <laughs> if they're anonymous. Brick! Or, Okay, okay. Well, uh, Rick? Brick. Oh, Brick. This is oh, a very Brick. intelligent Brick person is named Brick, yes. Oh, good. All right. Uh, Brick. I don't know about uh, the, the, well, the parents Brick, may have made a mistake uh, then. Got, well, oh, that's a great point. Terrible. And I, I would like to figure it out, Brick. And uh, I'm with you on it. And certainly I'm just very grateful to have the shows and all the wide coverage we get on ITV. But yes, I would like to make them available sooner. You know, you mentioned uh, Mark Davis, and, you know, we asked, you know, how's he doing injury, and you told us everything like that. But uh, it does seem that sometimes people completely vanish, and it's like, where did this person go? What happened? So there's actually and, and, like, it takes a long time to finally figure it out, oh, they're hurt. Like, nobody ever told us, or it's like a, it's like a top secret. And obviously, you know, I think both in AEW and WWE, there's this desire to not talk about concussions if someone's out for that reason. Yeah. But sometimes it's like just an injury, and it's it's like they just disappear. Is there a, is there a reason that sometimes you you don't want to say you know so and so's been gone because of this injury? Sometimes it's because people have like private medical situations. Sometimes I don't want to give out too much info about what is happening with somebody. Sometimes sure. we probably your point could communicate it more clearly. I've been thinking about doing an injury report show, um, mm -hmm. and I have some different thoughts on it about doing something like talking about the injury report for social media. Um, and I think the most important thing is making sure that, like, you know, people are comfortable. I don't want to talk too much about people's injuries if they don't want to, but some of them are in the context of the wrestling match. So I think in the context of the wrestling match and knowing, hey, somebody's coming off this injury and it's part of their journey part of their story that's good but like you said some injuries people might not want to talk about there's some things uh where uh people are very sensitive about the injuries that they've had to overcome it's, you know sometimes it's not a positive memory you know these injuries can be a really painful memory for the wrestlers so it just depends but to your point there's probably times where i could communicate it better we should communicate it differently so you know sure I'll like we don't need to know out. like the specifics of an injury necessarily but you like say, you, you know Britt like baker's been gone for like a year now Jane and Hader. i don't think she's been injured an entire year but you know we could ask the question like what's what's the status of Britt baker do you know if Britt baker was cleared say a week ago i do not know if she was cleared a week ago well there you go so i wouldn't know i don't know if you would know how much time she was out but it's a good question uh so that's but i mean 
there there could be a list. I mean, even if you don't say knee injury, if they're uncomfortable, and if they're comfortable with it, obviously you could, you could say it. But just say um, personal reasons, if it's a personal reason, and not go into details or or in, injured, and just leave it at injured. At least people would kind of know because you know we'll get questions from people all the time, and it's like they don't know if they're. Um, you know what's going what's going on especially when they're yeah. not people you know I that's mean, a good like, point but the other thing point. also tony is, is better, when you mentioned yeah. when you asked me if she was cleared and i didn't know it's like well actually i don't think that like officially it was ever even said that she was injured well, we like it kind of came I out in different that. ways it, it, it's been said it's been said lately well yeah, yeah but it's been said on press conferences but like on television you know oh, right. there are fans of, of her true. and many right. others that's true. and sure. you know as fans are just like where did she go? We haven't seen her in a year, and like there's never a mention, or you know, here's a video package. She's you know dealing with an injury or whatever, or or, or, or even building up, or even like some with, with someone who may they may not be on the next pay per view, but just do a thing of them rehabbing to build for, you know, like I'm on my way back. Just even if it's just a quick, sure. you know, if it's a top person. I mean, sure. obviously, yeah, we obviously have, can't we do have done that in some cases. In other cases, yeah. uh, you know, where we haven't talked about specific injuries, I haven't done that as much. Yeah. But these are, like I said, there's been a lot of the top stars where we have. Kenny Omega is a good example where yeah. we have given some updates and tried to work it in. Yeah. I, Kenny Omega is one of the biggest stars ever in AEW, so that's a really important thing to do. Uh, and there's other ones that are big stars. So at your point, there's some of the big stars and, and, and uh, that you could potentially give updates on. And for some of the other big stars, too. So yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a good point. I'll take that on board for sure. Yeah. Now, one thing that, that has been... I think like and you know it's funny because every I, I feel like um, there's there's certain thing that's been going on kind of like for the last couple of months it's 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 um combination of a perception thing and and the media rights thing and it's kind of like I see it I see it on on the internet in the sense of people you know a group of people who are you know waiting for you to fail and waiting for you to succeed and everyone is getting impatient I always say like look when the deal's done, it's done, and I I don't worry about the day it's done as long as it's done by you know December thirtieth, I suppose. But um, but the whole thing is is like there's people on both sides who really want to clap back on the other, and this deal has become like a real interesting thing. And even you in dealing with some of the media stories, like you know the one that we talked about once um, about how you know you were unhappy or not unhappy or whatever. But you know how this stuff is all getting out. You know, I mean, it's like I think we all know how this stuff's getting. Yeah, out. oh yeah, we all do. Uh, we mean, all please, do. please, please, why don't you enlighten them? Well, people, people say stuff, and uh, you know, go through different channels and everything like that. You know, I mean, that's, well, who, who, who's feeding them this information? Well, uh, well, pray tell. well, well, pray tell. Who do we? Who, I mean, I don't want to say, but I think that we all can come to an assumption. I think you said it. I appreciate <laughs> when you said it. You might as well say it again. I don't well, yeah, no, no, no. Of course, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, no. Of course, some of some of it's come, some of it comes from through wwe of course um cer certain certain negative things of course that's part of the game um that and it's been the game for 40 years i mean like let's yeah. face it um but i mean like the whole thing is there's the, you, you're fighting a perception battle though um I, we talk yeah, about it in all some the time. ways we are because it's perception is in some ways reality but yeah uh, you know the the deal the media rights deal is major perception that's major league perception history will be written on it yeah do i look worried <laughs> no, I'm not. It's going really well, and I'm a warrior. I I worry about stuff. I stress and I think about stuff all the time. I'm, you know, I try to keep uh try to keep it light and try to you know stay positive and fun about stuff. But I also really, really in this case feel really good about it, and we're in really good shape. There's a lot to be done, and it's a lot of work. But you know, a lot of that work's been done, like. That's why I use the analogy of being in the red zone. Like, this is the most important time to execute. But you also can look and say, like, we did a lot to get here. When you're in the red zone, you, you maybe you got here, you know, sometimes people, the offense can come out on the field because the defense made a great play or there was a uh, turnover on special teams. Not every time you end up in the red zone did the offense necessarily drive the ball up the field. But in this case, that's what we did. I feel like we started this thing backed up against the goal line and over the last five years we have come out uh we've gone past the logo and uh past the 50 yard line and uh in 
prodded into the red zone, and I'm really uh, feeling good about it, but that doesn't mean the hard work's done. That means this is the most important work. This is the highest leverage work. The things we do now, this is the clutch. But yep. everything we did to get to this point is really important, too. And, you know, if we uh, hadn't if we hadn't done a lot of really great things in the past five years, we wouldn't be in this position that we're in. So, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about it. But to your point, I mean, it is uh, it's challenging because you're fighting against a competitor that has outlasted and beaten down all the other competition. And uh, we're really fortunate because there are a couple of major international wrestling companies that have sustained their business. And when you look at the rich history of New Japan Pro Wrestling and CMLL, I'm really glad to be working with these companies. It's a dream come true. 20 years ago, I was in college, and I was a wrestling fan. And like a lot of wrestling fans in their 20s, I was watching the wrestling on television and following it on the Internet. And, uh, you know, it, I wasn't doing as much of it in my phone now as I would be today. But I was online, I was on my laptop, I was watching wrestling on TV 20 years ago, and it would be a dream come true to be working with New Japan and CMLL 10, 20 years ago for me. And these companies, they have a rich history, they've sustained, unlike a lot of the other promotions. You know, when I was a kid, it was a transitional period for the wrestling business. I was reading magazines in the supermarket. And there were some territories. Smoky Mountain was a new territory, and then ECW popped up in Philadelphia after that. But Smoky Mountain out of Knoxville, that was something new. But there, for those new companies, there were 10 to 20 that had gone out of business. Everybody uh, did. It, and oh, and, all, and all over the all over the world, not just not just U.S. I mean, in U.K. and um, or, or got less and less significant, and then went out of business. Austria, Germany, all over the world. I mean, it really was. When you really look at, it, as far as like at a, on a at a high level, it was really just Japan and Mexico, as you know that 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 maintained like uh, strong promotions because WWE gets on television and it makes everybody look weak. You know that's yeah. Well, it's something that we have going now is there's a lot of great wrestling here in AEW and in New Japan, Stardom and CMLL, and it feels like. You know, like something like an, uh, an old NWA super show to see a bunch of the different promotions descend and put on something special. Because here we are in New York mm. at UBS Arena and to have CMLL and the top stars from Japan, from New Japan and Stardom and the top stars from TBS and TNT all coming together to put on a show with over one million dollar gate and over 10,000 fans in New York. It's not lost on me being in New York what we've done because a lot of my competitors never did anything like that. Yeah. Well, when when did Eric Bischoff ever come in New York and do a $1 million gate? They never did a $1 million gate. They never did a $1 million gate. But he, he anywhere, had, ever. anywhere, let alone in New York City. Yeah. Ever, ever. That's true. That's true. Well, well you know, the, the one thing also, it's, it's funny that you bring that up because um, when I, I was actually in, in, in my story on uh, that I wrote about Sika this week, um, you know, I started looking back at the, the Mid South Superdome shows. And the Forbidden Door, it's not exactly the same, but it's very, very similar in the sense that, you know, they have their core, Miss South had their, and it's, it's funny because, again, when people go like, oh, I only want to see, why are they bringing in other people? And it's like, I'm thinking like, have you ever followed, it's like, I sometimes I get frustrated because I've followed wrestling for so long and seen so much. But it's like, have you ever like watched, like when you were a kid, I mean, well, they weren't because they weren't born, the Omni shows when they would bring everyone from all over, they're bringing the funks and everyone, were not on TV every week, you know, or the Briscoes or, or Dusty or whatever, or, or Ernie Ladd or, or, you know, Andre, you know, whatever. People from other territories augment on the big show. Not just your your guys. And Mid South did the same thing. They would bring in people from Georgia. They'd bring in people from World Class. They would bring in people yeah. from WWE. You know, I mean, it was like that's what that's what that's what separates your normal weekly TV from your big show. And this is your big show. And it's like we're you know it's cool that we're getting not only the stars, but we're getting you know we could see Mystico. I mean, look, you know, see Tam Nakano, whoever. I wouldn't have thought that that was ever going to happen here. Whether and if it works, it works, you know. But um, yeah, yeah. I um, well, I think New York City is a good place to try Mystico with Pena and Phoenix. Frankly, yeah, I think that's going to work really well here, and also to put that other team against them. You know, to have Teton, somebody I've really liked for years and wanted to work with since the beginning of AEW, and now finally can. And he had been in Ring of Honor, and he had a great match on TV with Cody. 
when Cody was the Ring of Honor champion, and I thought that was fantastic, and he was somebody I always really wanted to be able to use. And Hiromu was such a fantastic star. You know, it's great to have Hiromu here. And like I said, I really loved Suji. So I'm really excited for that match. I'm excited to have, uh, like you said, Tam, Momo, great to have stardom wrestlers here. Having all these great international wrestlers and our wrestlers come together in New York to put a show like this on, it's awesome. It's historic. It's cool. And especially following up on the success this show's had in Chicago and Toronto. Well, you know, the other thing, too, in, 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 uh, when you talk about this million-dollar gate, you know, you are two day, literally two days removed from the other, from WWE at the Garden. So it's, it's actually a lot more impressive doing a million dollars two days after. And the competition, look, look, they sold out the Garden, and, um, you know, they put on a great show. But, I mean, the point is, is that, you know, under normal circumstances, in normal wrestling history, if we're going to go by normal wrestling history, that should have screwed you that they were running the garden two days before your pay per view, and and I'm not saying that that's that was their plan, but I mean obviously historically that was always the the, the way that they did it. Um, but what, but the fact is is that you know you coming in and doing a big gate for this one, I mean that's 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 a feather in your cap. I mean it's it's when you go like a million dollar gate, which is always good for your company. Um, it's one thing, but when you're doing a million dollar gate two days after they're in the same market. Um, you know, that's it's even more impressive to me. Thank you. I appreciate that, Dave. It means a lot, especially for your, you know, from you as an expert and a historian of wrestling. That means a lot. And I appreciate it. And, you know, going back to what you're saying about the shows and the way the crew can change. I've always loved that about Mid-South. But it's, it's different. You know, it's different than other wrestling companies because when we bring in outside people, you establish them on your TV. It can kind of change. The TV changes and flows, and the crew that you see on TV ebbs and flows. I always thought that was a fascinating thing about Mid South. How, like, from one taping to the next, they'd be using some different people. Uh, you know, when the world class guys were there, and then for like six, six to eight straight weeks, there was a lot of world class people. You know, the Von Erics, Gino Hernandez. I thought it was fascinating how when Gino Hernandez showed up in the Irish McNeil Boys Club for Mid South, Gino Hernandez was over. And he was supposed to be a heel. <laughs> and he was like, they loved him. Uh, well, because he was a star. He was a star. Yeah. 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 He came off like a big TV star there. And like, even though he was a heel on the world class TV, they clearly knew he was a big deal and they knew who he was. But they were excited to see him, even though he was a big heel. He got re a different reaction than the big heels in the Mid South, like around then, like the Midnight Express, who they were, you know, good, great. TV wrestlers. They were great TV wrestlers, great stars on the Mid-South TV, but they were getting booed and people throwing stuff at them. And then uh, to see Gino, like you said, he got a big star reaction when he came in. So it showed me that people had been watching the world-class TV when, you know, that was the way they reacted to him and the Von Erics. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's great to be able to bring in stars from other places, especially with our international partnerships, and uh, then send our stars down where it can help our partners, you know, like we've done with New Japan and CMLL this year. You know, another uh, philosophical question as a booker. So the main event of your show, you've got you've got Swerve Strickland, who's a guy that showed up two years ago, and he's worked his way up the ladder, and he became the AEW World Heavyweight Champion. And then you've got Will Ospreay, who walked right in as a gigantic star, one of the biggest stars in the entire company, and so now they're facing off against each other for the title. As a booker, do you feel that it is, like, the main priority is for you to create stars? Do you think that the main priority is f on the wrestlers to make stars out of themselves? Or do you feel it's a little bit of both? H how, do you, how do you see the star-making process in AEW? It's everybody's... We are, we're a team. And it's just like in football, like if I'm coaching and the guys are playing, I mean, they have to make the plays and all I can do is do my best to put them in the position. But I also have to do my job. It's as to, we all have to do it. And Will Ospreay is a great example of a playmaker. And if you can come up with ways to get this guy the ball, he's going to do great for you. Swerve Strickland is a core player on this team and somebody, like you said, who's worked his way up. They have what is going to be an incredible in-ring dynamic, and it's going to be an amazing match. I think each of them has gone out and done so well for us. And I, the only thing I didn't agree with you on, Brian, is I feel like Will Ospreay earned this position by coming in as an international star and 
it did a few things. First of all, to our fans, they got to know Will Ospreay. He clearly, again, like we talked about when Gino Hernandez showed up, even though he'd never been on the TV, when Will Ospreay walked into AEW, like the fans really wanted to see him. Uh, and they were excited. Yeah, that's my point. Like, he walked in day one, and he was a top guy. Two he years was seen ago. by the fans as a but top I'm guy. But I'm saying two years ago he walked into AEW. Well, he sure. wasn't wrestling here. Like, I, yeah. I mean, it's a little different, right? Because I felt like you were referring to Will Ospreay, the guy who came in as a free agent in 2024. And I'm saying Will Ospreay's been here and has been here a good amount. Like, it's, you can't ignore the past, right? It's history. I like to embrace wrestling history. Uh, Will Ospreay was never here until 2022. And when he walked in for the first Forbidden Door, you know, day, I called, it would have been different stuff, as I pointed out to Dave, had some injuries and stuff not happened, but he was going to wrestle on Orange Cassidy, they were going to have a great match, we could have done some different things on the run up to it, it would have, I think, been even more interesting than what we did, but it was a great part of the TV, and Will Ospreay came in as a big star, and then anytime he came back, it felt like that, and then last year, he had one of the best matches ever in AEW with Kenny Omega, and he went to Wembley, and he was a huge star on the show, and he wrestled Chris Jericho. So now you've got him wrestling two of the best AEW champions ever, Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega, beating them both. And uh, you've got him uh, wrestling Orange Cassidy, one of our top stars, beating him. He's come in and done really, really well, but he arrived here, I guess I was trying to say, Brian, as part of New Japan. Now, that also, I think, pushed him in free agency why... This would be a great fit working together. I have worked with him. He's come in, you sure. know, almost like a home loan. Like I, I think. I think what I'm trying to say is like, let's take a Zack Saber Jr. Okay, Zack Saber Jr. You know, he's been there several times. He was there on on Wednesday, but like Zack Saber Jr. gets like a good reaction. But it's not like when he walks in the door the first time, the fans are like, you know, this guy's a future world champion. Like he's whereas Will Osprey, like. He stepped in the door day one. Zack Saber Jr.'s though. I wanted. I, I I'm not saying anything negative about Zack. If I let you, I'm not saying anything negative about Zack. Saber Jr.'s great name. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm not. But no, I'm not saying that. But like, if if you if Zack and and Will Osprey <laughs> walked in on the same show, I mean, the fans. Zach, some, some 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 you know. Some yes. people have more. Some people have more charisma than others. And I, and again, I don't, don't want to say. I mean, look. I don't want to say nothing bad about Zack either because Zack is one of my favorite wrestlers. I could have said Hechicero. How about Hechicero? But I don't want to say negative about him either. <laughs> hey, Will, well, Will is something I, I, very I, I, special. Will, 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 He's Will something special. very special. Will is very special. I think That's we can true. all agree on that. That he is something very special in terms of. Well, Osprey is fantastic, yes. and so is Swerve. And this match is going to be fantastic. And like you said, they've taken different paths to get here. I've been working with both guys for about two years. The first year, uh, Will Osprey was coming in with New Japan. Swerve was coming in as a free agent. He's been here the whole time. Swerve has definitely had a completely different path working his way up in AEW. I agree with your point. And it makes for a fascinating dynamic and a fascinating match. Yet, Will Ospreay has been in the AEW galaxy. He's been part of it, and he's worked here. But he was working with New Japan. He came, every time he came in, it felt like we were seeing a huge star. And I think then when he went to free agency, that made a lot of sense to me that I know this guy's going to come in and be a big star for us because I've already had him here and he was a big star and he's getting better and better. And for him, I think I hope, you know, based on what he said and how it's all gone, you know, he had trust in me and we like working together. And, you know, that was the benefit of New Japan loaning him to us, working together on shows, you know. And I think now with him being here, He's come in, and he's one of the biggest stars in AEW full-time every week. And Swerve Strickland is somebody that has been, to me, over the past year, has gotten better and better and bigger and more important and better on the show. And when you look at when he started his program with Hangman Page, it felt like Swerve was a rising star with a really bright future. And his momentum has continued to ascend, and he's been through all these great things, whether it was double or nothing over a year ago uh, with Orange Cassidy, and then going into uh, his program with Hangman, having uh, great rivalry, great matches. I thought Swerve was great in the Continental Classic. And then this entire year with Hangman, with Samoa Joe, and then with Christian Cage, we've seen Swerve outstanding on pay-per-view, great matches on TV, and the intensity has only continued to rise. I thought the stuff with Swerve and Will Ospreay this week was excellent. And it was a great end of the show. And also, I thought it was probably lately that 
the most edge we've seen back from Swerve since he was battling Hangman, which I really like. And so I'm very excited for the match. And I agree with you. They've taken different paths. I, I, uh, I think it's going to be a really fascinating dynamic. You can tell the guys have a lot of chemistry when they're on screen together. And they're so, so great. Both of them, the matches they've had, like I said, with the individual people separately have been some of the best stuff in AEW over the past year. And bringing them together, I think, is going to make for something really special to have the international champion versus the world champion. Um, decision to go to Arlington for the summer. Um, from a, is, is, it, is this basically uh, beneficial financially, or is it just easier on the crew being based there? Or what were kind of the reasons that you made the decision to, you know, run so many shows in that esports arena? There's so many great reasons. First of all, it's a it's an incredible market. It's an incredible city. It's a great place. The Dallas Metroplex. We already started talking about it on this on this Skype. Uh, how great the history of the wrestling is there, and and it's one of the best wrestling markets. And when you have one of the best wrestling markets and a place that AEW specifically does really well, where we have great fans, where we have wrestlers and crew that live there, where like you said, it's economically very viable versus touring every week for all the shows and being able to anchor Collision there, do great live shows on TNT in a red-hot environment in a new place, in a state-of-the-art facility. There's so many positives, and the city of Arlington is a great relationship for us that we think we can grow in addition to the eSports Stadium. So I think there's a lot of possibilities for it, and... You know, the Texas fans have been red hot, and this is something cool we can do to bring wrestling there every week and, and try something different. And Collision's been doing really well. Like I said, two weeks ago, we had that great head-to-head -head number for us, and then last week we were up another 13%. So I really believe uh, this could be something really cool to try, and it's a exciting time for us, and Arlington's a great place. So, of course, a couple of weeks back, there was uh, a lot of uh, discussion about a uh, the Dynamite rating, which was uh, so low that, like, initially, like, everybody got the ratings, like, we got to check to make sure this is not a glitch. And uh, your thoughts on on uh, all of that with the rating being uh, largely back to normal this, this past week? It was week. completely, was it not completely back in every way? I was think it was it like point .1. identical or yeah. up in it, some it's, way? It's, 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 it was, you know. Aside from males 18 to 34, you know. But it was very um, similar to the number two weeks ago in most ways. In some ways, yeah, it was higher. In 25 to 54, it was higher. Yeah. And uh, and everything else was in, like, you know, it was very similar to. It was, it was a similar audience two weeks ago, yeah. 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 And, and, uh, and what I noticed was it was a holiday week, and the holiday programming was different. And typically, yeah. the holiday ratings aren't included in the average, yet everybody was talking about it. But when my competition did the lowest rating in the history of their show on a holiday, after over 30 years of the show, none of you said anything. Oh, well, I said it was the holiday. We all knew. Yeah, well, well I didn't get but, that. But, 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 <laughs> Not from you. Still, you fucked, still, but like, from still, the benefit still. of the doubt, from the media, like when a rating's low on a holiday, like I guess... I I I, 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 I mean, I, I think that it was a combination. I think it was a lot of, uh, you know, the, the lead in not being there. But yeah, still, it was. Which was it, part of the holiday programming, right? Yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, which relates to the holiday. I think that there was. um, But still, it was like, it to me, it was scary because, honestly, I thought that, that was going to be a good rated show. I thought it was. And I thought it was an excellent show, which doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a good rated show, but I thought Max's first match back. And just a little bit of momentum and some good shows building up to it. I thought it would do good, and it, it did I, not when, do good. Gabe, when I saw the tune-in for that show and how good it was, and I sent that to you. Well, I, 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 I know, I know. That's some of the best tune-in we've had. And I know that. with I know. any kind of a lead-in, that would have done a great number. And as it was, that's a great number for what it was. It actually does demonstrate something to people in the TV business who actually know what ratings are and actually understand this professionally, as opposed to, like, the thankfully a very very educated audience which is the amazing wrestling fans who know more about Nielsen ratings than 99.9% .9 of the population but not more than the network people and it's fascinating because from a network perspective this was a really really good number in a lot of ways to see that with no lead in we were able to pull such great tune in and like I told you the network had been down 68% from 4pm to 8pm and yeah. from 7.45 p.m. to 8 p.m. was down week over week, 63% from 
from the 15 minutes before Dynamite. And then the first 15 minutes of Dynamite, we swung it from 63% to 13%, purely on our own tune-in with no lead-in whatsoever. That shows that without a lead-in, we can pull programming in. But nobody actually wants to do that. I think it's also funny that if we benefit from a lead-in, if the show's after like a, a big playoff game or something, I think people would say if we did a really good number, it was only because of the lead-in. And the same people then don't know how lead-ins work. Uh, so, you know, it's like, I definitely think it demonstrated that without a lead-in, we can pull great tune-in. But also it shows why lead-ins are important in television. Like nobody, if you offer them a choice of doing a show after something that had a good audience or something that nobody was watching. Nobody wants to go after the thing nobody was watching. It literally goes back to the saying, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's watching, well, it's like, you know, you're thankfully for us, we bring in people that came to watch the tree fall, but there was nobody in the forest until we started, uh, you know, knocking down trees and MJF and Arush uh, went out there. So, um, you know, that was big. You know, I don't know if you uh, quantified that, that we're up 250% over what was on before us. <laughs> That's good. That's, yeah. That shows you add value to the network, especially on a holiday when the network was having not their best day. Well, before we wrap it up today, there is a pay-per-view tomorrow. I don't know if you mentioned I, it I, yet. I, I, I Forbidden Door. I actually want one more thing. One more yes, thing. One yes, more. Dave. Yes. Um, just so for everyone to know, because it became like this big story last week, um, what happened with Ultimo Guerrero? Yeah, I, I think I told you. You well, did tell uh, me, but I just, but I just, uh, but I just, I just want people to know because it became, it became a story. You know, it sure did. That, as far as that match and everything like that. Well, what did you hear? Oh, just you know, he he got there. He didn't have a mask. He had to put get a mask on. But I mean, the big question is, is that the guy hasn't worked with a mask in ten years? So, he has in Japan. He has in Japan, but it's a general rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has in Japan, and that was the match that you know. Uh, I had last seen, and it was also the match uh, that he had sent video package in from Japan, and Rocky in the office had said there would, there would, you know, he's great. I think that uh, I love Ultimo Guerrero. I'm a big fan of his, but we thought he was coming in with it, and uh, they, the office had said to bring it, and I think it was not a miscommunication. So uh, it was definitely something I expected to do in the match would be Okada to pull it off, and, and he Pulled it off. He got he got it off all right. Uh, it came, turned out to look great on the finish. But um, I would have uh, ideally, you know, that it, we've had so many great things. That was like, you know, one thing that was maybe a miscommunication. But there were so many great things uh, going into Forbidden Door. That is probably one of the not more interesting topics to me. But but fair enough. Well, it was a, it was it was it was a topic. But yeah, no, I mean, and on, I mean, as far as like the show. So so we're talking about thirteen, fourteen matches, right? It's currently yeah. it's currently thirteen, and if you yes. add another one on collision, it would be fourteen. Yes, that is correct. Yes. Yeah. Well, Swerve Strickland and Will Osprey for the AW title is the main event, and uh, the winner will be challenging the winner of the Owen Hart Cup, which is coming up. Uh, well, it's July, ongoing July 10th, right now. Yeah, July tenth, July tenth finals in Calgary. Yeah, we got Brian Dalton Shingo in a first round men's Owen Hart Cup tournament match. You know, we didn't we didn't even talk about that match. That's like two of the best wrestlers in the world you know and what well, they probably haven't wrestled in how many years 15 years they, they wrestled in ring of honor once because i remember the match was phenomenal but it's been forever since we've seen them and and i mean um i mean it's, that's a great reason know, to buy this pay-per-view everybody there's a lot there's, yep. hey, look, look it's it's as, as far as a wrestling show goes i mean i ran the thing over we would go match by match with garrett and it was like as we went through the thing it's just like this is really i mean it's it's I, I kind of see this as a can't miss show because even if let's say one guy has a bad night, one match doesn't deliver that you expect, you got 11, 12 more that on paper look anywhere from good to fantastic. And that's like another yeah. and, and and I think that like, you know, the Will match and uh, the Danielson match, I mean, they're they're pretty much can't misses. I mean, it's like unless somebody breaks their leg, I mean, those matches are going to be incredible. And well, and and, yeah. and and really up and down the show. It's, I mean, uh, it's, Mox and I, I thought Mox and Naito in Chicago was fantastic. I'm really excited match. for the rematch with Mox and Naito. Like you said, Brian and Shingo, we hadn't even gotten into that. I'm really so excited for Daniels and Shingo and Swerve and Osprey. Fantastic. And we haven't talked about Mercedes Monet and Stephanie Backer, which is, yeah, you know, I've been they, looking they, forward they to talking year. to some of these matches. That's a really, really cool situation. And I briefly yeah. touched on how great it was to have Mercedes go to 
Arena Mexico, and it's been great to have Stephanie in AEW, and I'm excited to have Stephanie wrestling tonight on TNT on Collision, and I think that's a huge, huge match. The implications to have a star from CMLL who holds the New Japan Strong Women's title, going title for title, wrestling against the TBS champion, and especially when the TBS champion is Mercedes Monet. This is a really big deal. Got Moxley and Naito for the IWGP title, which you talked about a little bit there, but uh, big rematch. And you know that that, uh, that Naito said that if uh, if John Moxley beats him, he's going to let John Moxley do the uh, the G one. Well, that would be interesting. Now, if if uh, if that happens, uh, that's he will, may slot him in there, and that may be something we'd have to work out for the summer. I love having uh, John here, but if he could get a spot in the G1, I'd be very open to it. I also think Takeshita being in the G1 is a great thing for us this year. Um, but as it stands right now, they haven't scheduled it that way. But if John wins and he gives him his spot, that could be something to be seen. Uh, the first match in Chicago was fantastic. John absolutely knocked it out of the park, I thought. And it was a real history-making moment. And when Naito uh, came to Dynamite, that felt like, uh, a big thing. He's really one of the greatest stars ever in New Japan, and uh, it's great having him here at Forbidden Door. We got Zack Saber and Orange Cassidy in a match where Orange says, "I don't know any of these moves," so that's going to be a fun one. MJF and Hechicero <laughs> is uh, is on the show. We've got uh, the Learning Tree, Jericho, Big Bill, and uh, should I say it? Show hasn't aired yet. Jeff Cobb. Jeff Cobb against Samoa Joe, Hook, and Shibata. Well, when is this going to run? When are you guys going to post? We're live, this? brother. We're live? So you yeah. guys are telling me right now that uh, that you guys just told everybody what happens on Collision? Well, you um, know, Dave, sometimes uh, he gets the scoops, Tony. <laughs> I don't know if you know this I think not. there was a good amount of people that, you know, but okay, that's fine. Yeah, well, okay, yep, you, cat's out of the bag, everybody. <laughs> Tony Storm and Mina Shirakawa. AW World Women's Title, Mariah May. Is Mariah May at ringside? She got hit with a bottle on Wednesday. Is she all right? She is okay, and she's going to be in both women's corner, and she's going to wrestle against Soraya in the Owen Hart Women's Cup Tournament. That's right. That is, uh, that's on the, uh, the kickoff zero show. Hour. That zero will be on hour. the big zero hour. Yep, zero it's, hour. He's going into overtime this week, my friend. Statlander and Momo Watanabe versus Willow Nightingale and Tam Nakano. Also on the... Uh, on the pre-show, Zero Hour. We, we, we've talked about the Young Bucks. We'll, we'll get to that. We got uh, Yoda Suji, Titan, and Hiromu versus the Lucha Brothers and Mystico, which we did talk about earlier. And the latter match for the vacant title, the TNT title, has Takeshita, Mark Briscoe, Jack Perry, Dante Martin, Leo Rush. And are we going to still leave that uh, question mark in there? Well, no, that was Eel. That was last Miranda. night. All right. Yeah, that's okay. That was last it's night. El Fantasmo. El Fantasmo it is then. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, he's fantastic. I'm excited Saturday. for that. That's, I'm really excited for that ladder match. And it'll be great that's a, that's to a, have. That's a, that's a crazy match. Yeah. yeah. And yes, your elite match. The Young Bucks and Okada against Anthony Bowens, Max Caster, and Hiroshi Tanahashi, the president of New Japan Pro Wrestling. Yeah. Very cool to have. Uh, the Scissor Ace, the Scissor President, uh, the Scissor Administration, the acclaimed in Tanahashi versus the Elite, Okada and the Young Bucks. That's and right. uh, you, you could say a lot about uh, about the Elite and, and uh, Okada and the Young Bucks, but I would say uh, three wrestlers that have really made their name in different ways uh, in New Japan Pro Wrestling that have had great experiences there. Obviously, I think Okada is one of the greatest wrestlers in the history of the promotion and in the country. And... There's a lot of history there that they have with Tanahashi, so particularly Okada. So I think that makes it really interesting. All right. Well, before we go, let's get some plugs in. How can people watch the show? And uh, I can plug some Dynamite and obviously Collision coming up tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, Collision coming up tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central on TNT. It's going to be a, a tremendous show. Uh, Brian and Dave spoiled a, a few things, but we've got some really exciting things on the show. Uh, and w it's going to be a great way to go into the pay-per-view, including the weigh-in with Swerve Strickland and Will Ospreay. Uh, lots of exciting things up and down the show. We've got the Owen Hart Women's Tournament uh, with a great match with Hikaru Shida versus Deanna Perrazzo. Uh Orange Cassidy teaming with Tomohiro Ishii versus TMDK. Lots of great stuff up and down the card. And a big preview of that ladder match with a great trios match just to build it up 
uh, with those six great wrestlers fighting for that vacant TNT championship. Uh, there'll be a lot of awesome things tonight on Collision. And, of course, tomorrow in New York at UBS Arena. You can all check it out either on pay-per-view or come in person. It's going to be a great show. Like Dave said, uh, it's can't miss. This is going to be an awesome, awesome night of wrestling. And I hope you're all able to watch it. It's lots of different ways to watch on pay-per-view with cable, satellite, Bleacher Report, uh, Fight, Triller, PPV.com, YouTube, uh, or go to your Dave & Buster's nearby. Lots of great ways to watch AEW. Uh, and please uh, check out AEW Dynamite on Wednesday in Chicago. It's a holiday week. It's July 3rd. And a great way to celebrate uh, is going to be AEW Beach Break. There's so many awesome things on this show. The winner of the Shingo versus Danielson match will take on Pac in Chicago at Beach Break. That's going to be a fantastic match. You, either either possibility is so great. And we'll have the women's tournament continuing with a semifinal match with Chris Statlander versus Willow Nightingale, two former TBS champions. Willow Nightingale, the defending Owen Hart Cup winner, and they got a great tag team match coming up uh, along with uh, Tam and, and Momo coming up on uh, the Zero Hour tomorrow and uh, looking forward to that and also really excited for the wild card wrestler to arrive in AEW and take on Jeff Jarrett who has been so great building up the Owen and, and talking about his experiences and friendship with the late great Owen Hart which means a lot to all of us and we're all very appreciative to Dr. Martha Hart for allowing us and working with us uh, on the Owen Hart Cup tournament. And we talked a lot on this show about the international champion, Will Ospreay. He might be the world champion by Wednesday. And he is going to put the gold on the line, all the gold, at certainly the international title and potentially the world championship versus Daniel Garcia, who's been on a great streak of wins and is red hot and really connecting with the fans and I think that's going to be some great matches in Chicago next Wednesday. And first and foremost, uh, Saturday tonight on TNT. And, of course, uh, foremost, the pay-per-view tomorrow, Forbidden Door. And all the great wrestlers, like I said, descending as we speak on New York. It's an exciting time. Okay, the one the one more women's semifinal. So is that, is that going to be on Saturday or a week from, a week from tonight? The other uh, there'll semifinal? Be, uh, there'll be pro I think there will be... Another semifinal, likely there was a there was last there was of course uh, we had Serena versus Willow Nightingale uh, was on Rampage a couple weeks ago. That was a great match and a great main event. Did really really well. Uh, I think there's a good possibility that uh, there could be uh, two semifinal matches in Chicago. So all four semifinals in Chicago, essentially, is what you're saying. Uh, no, the, the, not the men and the women. necessarily because no, not necessarily because uh, the okay. wild card is wrestling their first round. So you would have three semifinals and a quarterfinal potentially in Chicago. Okay, so, so the, right, 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 right. So, okay, okay. So the other women's semifinal would be Chicago, and then the and then line. there would be a men's semifinal that is coming in in Memphis. That would be in Memphis on Saturday. On okay. Saturday, yeah. And then the two finals, obviously, in Calgary on the tenth. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Well, Tony, hey, I want to thank you so much for doing the show here today. Let's do it again sometime. It's been, what, three years since we've uh, done this show together? So, no, I have been, it's not, been not, a not long time. Well, with me, it's been three years. I think you and I you think and, it's been three years, yeah. And, and I think good, Dave, yeah. Dave and I did uh, a show a couple of years ago in Vegas, uh, yeah. but it's been yeah. a long time. Well, yeah. Well, thank you so much for giving us 90 minutes today, and uh, best of luck with the rest of the day and tonight and tomorrow, and, uh, and thank you for coming on. And of course, yeah, it was great talking to you guys. Thanks for having me on. It was good catching up. And yep. thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll talk to you again after a while.